Welcome to Merchman Seeds Cup of Joe. On this episode, your crop update after we toured our Nebraska, Missouri, and Wisconsin sales areas this week. We have a continued discussion on diseases showing up in crops at this point of the growing season. Ben shares some initial yield check numbers from our power core and list corn. And we have a great supply of our Millie, Binti, and Matty Wheat brands. Welcome to Merchman Seeds Cup of Joe. Today we have Dylan, Lynn, and myself. Um, I think we're going to start off with a little bit of a crop update. We've been doing some traveling. Lynn, where have we been this week? Yeah, so we've gone to Missouri twice, uh, went up to northern Illinois, you went over to Henry County, uh, Iowa, as did you, uh, went out to Nebraska, and then back down to would be north central Missouri. So we've had a uh, wide variety of, of geographies to take a look at, uh, a lot of different planting dates, different uh, maturities that we've looked at uh, on the bean and the, on the corn side. So overall, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible that we cover that, that big a footprint and seeing pretty similar crop from east to west, north to south, as far as uh, everyone is probably a couple weeks ahead of schedule, it looks like from, uh, from a timing standpoint and talking with everyone in our, our travels as well, I think we're all kind of in the same boat. We've had a little bit milder uh, conditions, but we've always had sunlight in comparison to last year and talking to a lot of folks, uh, it was pretty widespread in dealing with the wildfire smoke or maybe a little bit more rainfall with cloud cover. So um, just a general observation. And I think that we've had more um, solar units uh, going on in the in the marketplace that we've pushed this crop a little bit ahead of schedule here compared to last year. Even though from a moisture standpoint, law of averages says most are probably right, uh, right close to what we had last year. Right. So how'd the crop look out in Nebraska? I think those guys should be very excited. Uh, you know, when you're talking dry land into the triple digits for yield potential, um, that, that, that's gotta be a pretty good day for those guys to be pretty excited about. Um, we looked at the 108 day that was at a dry land scenario. I think right there just was proof in the pudding that we've been told that it has southern germplasm, that it can run south. Uh, it'll be able to handle those stress conditions and dry land Nebraska is a pretty good indicator of, of will that thing thrive. Now granted, like we said, really good crop conditions as far as uh, that goes. Rainfall has been above average with what they've had uh, in years past, but uh, we have a lot of horsepower that comes with that defensive package as well. So it's a pretty good product that we're really excited about to push down into that Missouri market, out to that dry land market to, uh, to be able to hand those stress acres and, and if you wanna get early, um, as you get further south, it's, it's gonna be a phenomenal option to, to run that direction. Yeah, and I'm gonna go, out, go ahead and just give all the, all the information out. We got our first yield check. First guy that was checking out his combine, they had, like what you're talking about, phenomenal, phenomenal growing conditions in this individual location in uh, Nebraska. But our 2408C-30, um, pulling about an acre off, uh, yielded 330 out of 20% moisture. So if you do the, the drying down, it was a little over 300. So our first yield check came in positive. It's a great way to start the year. Right. Um, I'm very happy and very excited for these, for these, uh, these customers that have uh, went ahead and bought PowerCore and put the faith in us that we were putting good product out and uh, the, the customer was extremely happy. <laughs> really excited to get back into more of that corn. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I hope it's up from here. That's a pretty good start. I mean, the bar has been set pretty high, but when we look at that, and that, that's just the horsepower that we've seen behind that. That's, right. I, we shouldn't be too surprised to see that top end yield potential out of, uh, out of that material because we've been, we've been preached it. But at the end of the day, you know, we are farmers at heart. Uh, I'm from Missouri. I'm gonna go with the cliche, you gotta show me. And I think we're, uh, we're seeing farmers now in field we're getting away from the you know the testing data, all the the, the small strip trials that we've uh, been presented with. We're actually getting in field results that are, uh, to be honest with you, that exceeded expectation. Absolutely, yeah. No, I'm. You are right. The the, the, the first yield check was a, was a high bar that was definitely set. The stuff we looked down at Rodney's when we went down to Trenton, Missouri uh, yesterday. I mean, looking across that plot, I mean, I should be a well above average for him as well. Um, yeah. And that's a, you know, that, that, that's a, a market that is very hard to position hybrid just because they have very varying different soil types. You go from river bottoms, extremely high productive, talking to an individual who's putting on hog manure on bottom ground through pivots. 
Uh, and then you get into some white oak timber soils that are probably some of the most unforgiving terrain that we have to deal with. And, and guys are really excited about the corn that's out there right now that they're, they're seeing a lot of good uh, stress tolerance. We are seeing a little bit of disease in that area come in, um, but uh, the corn looks like it's holding on really, really well to, to push through that uh, disease pressure that's come in within the last um, two weeks. Right. What do things look like in Minnesota or uh, Wisconsin, Northern Illinois? Yeah, Northern Illinois, um, when I was up there, stuff is starting to go into senescence. Um, we're talking, you know, some 1.8 to 2 O's seem to be the predominant bean, uh, specifically that, that Cheyenne has a huge footprint up there. Starting to see those starting to uh, be in the beginning stages of senescence. White mold does seem to be uh, a little bit of an issue as we're, we're getting up in that direction. SDS starting to creep its head in a little bit, but uh, you know, at the field day I was at, and I'm gonna butcher the number, but it's somewhere between 28 and 35 inches of moisture that they had from April to July. So, you know, as we talk in those conditions, SDS, no matter what seed treatment you're running with, um, most um, short of the Cheyenne scores that you have from a uh, variety tolerance, we're really playing playing defense at that point to just hold on to uh, any yield potential that we have in those soybeans. Because we are, I mean, we are in the prime um, situation to have SDS manifest itself. Right, and a lot of those customers up there, you know, will treat everything with Starting Line Plus, which has Sultru in it and Chernemko. And uh, there's not a lot of checks out there because they want the full protection. Right. So we don't know how bad it could be um, if, if, if that, wasn't on there so you know. part of that i don't blame them because it's such a i mean in years past that they've done that it's been such a economic loss on those checks that like well, i don't want to lose that money on an acre i want right. to you know protect all that uh, on the corn side kind of the same boat we're seeing everywhere else uh, due to a lot of that uh, early season moisture potential timing of the application of uh, anhydrous a lot of fall anhydrous um, you were up there in that same geography mm -hmm. a little bit, uh, a little bit before I was. Uh, corn started firing off on the bottom from nitrogen deficiency pretty early. One caveat: the, the field that you had looked at. Fast forward to where I uh, was at. You're probably what, a month ago, two months ago? Oh, about a month ago. Um, that particular field actually has kind of leveled off. Uh, not seeing that that big. Uh, uh, transgression of that nitrogen deficiency showing up uh, clear up to the year leaf. It's kind of seems like it, it, it has stalled. Now whether that is the dry weather, uh, we've been able to potentially mineralize some organic matter and uh, maybe that nitrogen didn't completely leach away. It just ran a little bit further in the ground and the roots finally caught up. But uh, a very it's not a positive situation when you're that early running into nitrogen deficiency, but the plant being able to kind of stop uh, that progress progression, hopefully it does uh, hold on to a little bit of that yield potential that's out there. Yeah, and I got some pictures we can throw up of the areas that, you know, weren't ponded or didn't lose the nitrogen as fast. Our, our pictures on the left and the pictures on the right are the areas where, where the, the corn tipped back and it just ran out of nitrogen from way too wet of conditions. I don't know if there's, I don't know if there would have been an economic or a right time to go back in and add more nitrogen for the amount of rain that they continued to get. You know, July was a wet month, June was a wet month. They, they, they just not a lot of forgiveness in that Correct. area right now. Correct. So, yeah, um, I think we wanted. I'm stealing an idea from uh, uh, the Illinois Soy Envoy. Uh, they're they're a, they put a podcast on every Thursday, and uh, they they started something last week where they uh, pulled different pictures. Everybody that was presenting had to have a different picture for what they saw that week or this year or something that stood out in their in their mind. So, Dylan, what kind of pictures you got for us this week? Yeah, so uh, with all of our travels, we've seen a lot of corn. So that's kind of what I want to hit on the uh, 25. 12C-30, the new 112 day that we've kind of been bragging about, but seeing it out in Nebraska on irrigated ground with pretty good fertility and the moisture, it really shows. We've kind of seen it in some other areas. If you really push it uh, with good fertility, good management, it's going to really, really show off. And we've kind of seen, seen it in a little bit in plots, but now when plots are kind of moving along, they're starting to look better, but out in field setting, it just looks phenomenal. Um, with these pictures, it looks amazing, and that's what we were pushing for. Um, that was the, the market we were, we were pushing for, and it just shows that that high management, um, what it 
can really do. Yeah, so in your picture, you got five in a row. You got five five corn ears, and those were pulled five five plants in a row, and they're extremely representative of what was out there. And and that I think that that individual product has the ability to go way above and beyond 300 bushel per, per acre potential. And I'm really excited to see some yield maps come off of that field when it when the time comes. Yeah, and seeing those guys, we brought it back to that field day, and they were just in awe. They couldn't even fit their fit their hand around it, um, and that just the growers eyes just lit up so it's really something special that we've got going on with the, the 112 that we're bringing um, bringing to you guys next year yep that one is going to be available as a non-gmo and as a as a power core option as well so very exciting there lynn what kind of pictures you got for us well it seems to be that i've been kind of doom and gloom on uh, <laughs> this podcast so let's stay on brand here today so i've got pictures of some tar spot from here in in lee county we are uh, we're at that uh, point in time where you know talking with Rodney and, and as I mentioned looking at some tar spot and the uh, varieties that were down there kind of the same boat that's happened here fungicide application we're past that uh, that latency period uh, for the the second go around or potentially even the third go around we did a pretty decent job of of stopping it in its tracks and uh, now unfortunately our residual has has started to wear off and we're seeing tar spot show back up here so uh, for for full disclosure it is a competitors uh, uh, picture that uh, our competitors hybrid that we were we were looking at uh, and comparing our, our power core to what the the competition's doing and uh, it's it's potentially gonna be pretty devastating because we're at when this picture was taken I mean there's still a lot of potential left to put into this plant and uh, if this gets to the point where it's gonna start you know major uh, uh, either defoliation or or because right now when we're talking about sulfur and nitrogen we're already dealing with problems in this uh in these corn plants with uh, the relocation or translocation of nutrients as tar spot causes that uh that leaf to to die off early so in those hybrids what we're going to see is they're just they're not going to have enough uh, horsepower to get to the finish line and it's going to be a respectable yield don't get me wrong but uh there is a lot of uh potential there and weight that's going to be taken off the table because of that Right. And when I think about those scenarios, I'm thinking about the next time that field's going to be in corn. Those are the notes that I'm taking when you, when you see tar spot as severe as what that is. When, when there's still green tissue left on the plant, that's probably going to be an issue. When it comes to the guys that are doing the minimal tillage and trying to you know build organic matter, things of that nature, next time that corn field is going to be in corn again, I'm, I'm going to want notes on it. And I'm probably going to be planning on the double fungicide application to, to keep it alive as long as possible. Um, some of the other things that I'm thinking about when I see that, those are the fields that I'm going to start flagging for harvesting first. And I'm also thinking about, you know, what's the planting date? Because if I have a planting date of May 15th or later, you're exactly right. We're, we're, we're probably going to see some yield hit when we're seeing that level of tar spot out in the field. If I have an April 15th planting date, that corn is probably getting real close to black layer and uh, it's going to be next time's problem, not this year's problem. So those are some of the things I'm thinking about when, when tar spot comes in that severe. One of the differences between the power core from what we've seen the past three years in a lot of our, in a lot of our products, um, we can get tar spot. It doesn't typically get that bad until senescence, like once, once the plant is, is finally browning down, but we can get a certain level or a certain pressure of tar spot and the plants will still stay green. And then that comes from the Corteva based genetics that have a, uh, an advantage of higher tolerances to tar spot. They don't suck down because there was fields that I was in knowing that they are, um, genetics that come from a different camp other than Corteva is how I'm going to word it. Uh, they were green one week and they're completely brown the next and, and tar spot is what's doing that. So those are the guys that are really probably going to start chasing those fields to make sure that they don't, uh, don't have feed, corn that's going down because that, that's a real possibility. Lived it, breathed yep. it, been through it. So what'd you have there boss man i'm not your boss but i did have a picture of white mold and white mold continues to show its ugly face we've talked about it a couple times on on cup of joe here um 
it's kind of goes back to that sudden death talk, you know, with, with the inoculum that's in the soil and you give it the current environment, we can do everything in our power from a seed treatment standpoint to try to lessen the burden that uh, white mold has on different products. You can definitely go and look at the different scores and those scores come from MS Tech. They're real scores, they're not marketing scores. Um, we, we, we try to put our growers in the best position possible that we have, but at a certain point, it becomes a learning uh, or a training curve where we, we start talking about, okay, we're passing the baton off. I, this is something where we, you know, we need to use a super efficacious uh, R1 first flower uh, fungicide for white mold. Um, and uh, the Crop Protection Network has a, a list of a myriad of fungicides that specifically target white mold at the R1 time frame. It's not the, the R3 try to protect from septoria or uh, septoria or um, uh, like frog eye or things of that nature or, or plant health style of application but that's that's going to be a big key when it comes to controlling white mold cobra can be a big key when it comes to controlling white mold uh, lowering planting populations getting those soybeans in 30 inch rows are all good things that are going to help and even in the areas this year I would encourage guys that have the worst uh, white mold pressures in certain areas of their fields, there's a ex really expensive product out there that you apply in the fall that actually breaks down the, the fruiting bodies or the sclerotia of the, that white mold and it's called contans. So um, there's, there's multiple things that you can do to lessen the white mold and we, when we pass the baton off, you know, it's kind of out of our hands. We, we, we do the best job that we possibly can, but uh, fungicides, contents, and things that I, that I just talked about are, are extremely important when it comes to limiting that disease. And that disease is, is definitely showing its ugly head as far south as, you know, Champaign County, Illinois working its way all the way to our, our, our far northern reach of our sales footprint. So it's a, it's, it's a problem in Iowa, it's a problem in northern Illinois, it's a problem in Wisconsin, it's a problem in Minnesota, and uh, they've had the weather for it this year. So um, is there anything else we need to cover um, this week before we get to Lynn's awesome corny joke? Mm -hmm. Great time to order wheat. It is a great time to order wheat. We've had a lot of phone calls again this week. Guys calling from all over the the sales footprint, wanting to try wheat, um, putting the pencil to the paper and seeing what, you know, potentially 100 bushel wheat paired with 40 bushel double crop soybeans looks like on, on especially their more marginal acre. So um, we have plenty of wheat. The uh, Millie's in great supply, the Binti's in great supply, the Maddie's in great supply. Um, we're gonna have a huge amount of hyper earlys. I've been working on my wheat production plan for next year. We're gonna have a big amount of uh, the hyper early that we pick um, for next year. So um, it is a good time for be ordering wheat as well. So that gets us to the corny joke. It's not really a joke. I think uh, Joe's not here, so don't really wanna take his thunder. So I'm just not gonna tell a joke today. Um, but I, I did see something that was a little bit concerning as we were in our travels yesterday. We're coming back from Missouri, and it was a warm one still. I mean, we had a little bit of a break from, from rain that, that had happened, but, man, it, it picked the humidity back up. And uh, just standing out there by the bean plot just started sweating within 15 minutes. But it was so hot out on our way back home, we saw that funeral procession actually pull into a Dairy Queen. <laughs> you know, Dylan... With this weather, you probably got your air conditioner set pretty low. So if you run into some problems, it's a little too cold in your house, you can go stand in the corner because it's always 90 degrees. <laughs> pretty terrible jokes, Lynn. <laughs> hey, okay. I just want to make sure that Joe, uh, Joe doesn't think that I'm going to try to steal his thunder here. Yeah, there we go. Well, I appreciate everybody taking the time listening to us on podcast or watching us on YouTube. Uh, we hope you have a safe week. Harvest is getting ready to roll around the corner, so hope everybody's safe and harvest is fruitful, and we will catch you next week.